I hope you haven't gathered from the title of this that you're in for a televised art exhibit. The, the sketchbook part of it, frankly, is just a prop. A prop is a stage term. It's an abbreviation of the expression stage property. Anything that you may see up on a stage besides the actor and the scenery is likely to be a prop. For example, Yorick's skull is a prop, and uh, the Romeo's vial of poison, and the telephone and dial M for murder, they're all props. And they're props in real life. When we're self-conscious, we put our hands to our neckties and light a cigarette, all that sort of thing. In other words, a prop is just what it means in the dictionary. It's something to prop ourselves with. It's a, to, to, it's, it's a crutch, something to lean on. And so the sketchbook is a, is exactly that. It's a prop. It's something for me to turn to when I lose the thread of what I'm talking about. It's something for you to look at, besides my face, which ought to come as a nice break in the horrid monotony. I remember the first night I was ever in Hollywood. I, I would have been very grateful indeed for a prop like the sketchbook, because I did lose the thread. I, I was speaking. After dinner speaking, I'd been introduced as a great after dinner speaker. I don't know quite why, because I'm not. But I had been, and this was a great Hollywood dinner. Every star I'd ever seen in my life, I was tremendously impressed. There they all were, and a lot of other grand people besides Maharajas and all kinds of title folk, and I'd been called upon. Of course, being very frightened and very eager to please, I started a funny story, which I'd heard that day. And I'd gone on for a while when it dawned on me that I'd forgotten how it ended. I, I, I continued with the story. And I hoped that somehow I'd find, find an ending, somehow be able to invent one. And the people were all looking very eagerly, waiting for the finish, because they knew that although the story was very boring, it must be boring for a purpose. Obviously, it was boring because the end was going to be so tremendously amusing. They often looked at me eagerly, and I continued and continued. And I thought, how in heaven's name can I get out of this thing? I could pretend to faint or drop dead or rush out and yell fire. I continued to invent comical finishes that elicited no titters whatsoever quietly and secretly praying to myself to heaven. And then my prayer was granted. Ever, ever since then, I've, I've been a great believer in, in the efficacy of prayer, because just as I'd given up hope, just as I was wondering how I could get out of this situation, the walls started to shake. The chandelier fell down from the ceiling onto the table. The people jumped out of the table. This was California, remember. It was an earthquake. So I was... I was saved. My Hollywood career was saved by an earthquake. And I can't pretend that my drawings are any sort of earthquake, but they'll have to stand in for that sort of distraction. This is the Gate Theatre in Dublin. First night audiences are always an experience. In this theater, I faced the very first, first night audience of all in Dublin, that grand capital of eloquence and violent opinion where, where audiences enjoy and they delight in the privilege of free speech. And you can sometimes hear as much dialogue from the gallery as from the stage itself, where first nights often end in literal riot. And actors have been known to seek police protection from the public they're trying to entertain. Well, here I am in Dublin on that very first of all my first nights. If you don't recognize me, that's just as it should be. I am heavily made up for the role of the profligate and depraved Archduke in Jusus by Feuchtwanger. And as you can see from the drawing, there's almost no sign at all of anything resembling first night nerves. Now, there's a reason for this lofty calm. And it's the bliss of ignorance. Like a baby on a trapeze or a drunk taking the crest to run on the seat of his trousers, I was happy because I didn't know any better. For underneath all that makeup is a 
brash young amateur who hasn't seen his 16th birthday, and there's no assurance like that of the utter greenhorn. No, nobody, least of all an aspiring actor, is scared of being hurt until he's fallen on his face. You've all seen Donald Duck and uh, Pluto the Pup in the Disney cartoons when they run off the edge of a roof or off the ledge of a cliff, run quite a distance, and then they happen to glance down when they realize where they are, that there's nothing under them, they fall. Well, a beginner is rather like that. He goes tripping merrily out into space, no technique or no knowledge, anything of that kind, treading air as a swimmer treads water, and then he suddenly realizes where he is in a theater full of people. When he realizes what that means, then the happy dream changes to a nightmare. Here I am in act four, the same play. You may notice that I've aged somewhat, but uh, this is only partly makeup. In the play, I was supposed to be older, but uh, I've aged a bit under the grease paint as well. A terrible truth has just dawned on me, that an audience is not so much a compliment to uh, an actor's ego as a challenge to his capacities. Well, I've just received my first challenge. You may have noticed the startled look. This was Ireland, remember, where audiences take a sort of professional pride in unpredictability. It wasn't until many years later, in fact, only recently, that uh, the police had to be called out to protect me from the wrath of an Irish audience, but that's, that's another story. Maybe I'll tell that some other time. But, uh, I'd already received by Act Four of that very first night of all a pretty good uh, intimation of what was in store for me in the future. I remember the line that I'd just spoken. I'll never forget that line as long as I live. A pretty girl had just left the stage, Betty Chancellor, Dennis Johnson's wife. And I was supposed to look after her in my characterization as the, as the wicked old Archduke, watch her go lecherously and chortle, and say, a bride fit for Solomon. He had a thousand wives, did he not? Now, just at this moment, when I said that line, he had a thousand wives, did he not? A voice somewhere in the audience, about the fifth row of the stall, spoke up. I said, he had a thousand wives, did he not? And the voice said, that's a dirty black Protestant loy. Well, I've given that remark a good deal of serious thought. As a matter of fact, I've been brooding over it for about 20 years, and I still haven't thought of an adequate reply. And anyway, that moment, the sound of that voice was my first, my first experience of feeling like somebody unfortunate in Disney. That's when it was borne in upon me with frightful force that as an actor, I wasn't so much skating on thin ice as walking in thin air. When I realized where I was, I started to fall like blue to the pup. That's a long time ago. I've been falling ever since. And speaking of falling, it was actually a fall that saved me in Act Five. I was supposed to die of apoplexy in Act Five. Actually, I was half dead from fright. I was supposed to draw my sword shout wildly, ring the bells, and fire all the cannons, and then slump lifelessly into my throne. But uh, I had just made the terrible discovery that an audience is not necessarily a group of friendly well-wishers. An audience can be a, a pit full of ravening lions, and besides, there was the commentator in the fifth row. So I pulled at the sword and discovered that it was stuck in the scabbard. Well, well of course it was stuck in the scabbard. It was opening night. It always happens as a little invisible man who goes backstage on every opening night and glues the swords into all the scabbards and short circuits the telephones and uh, jams a few doors. That's uh, purely routine. As I say, I was a beginner. I didn't know about the invisible little man, so I pulled at the sword and pulled and pulled and after a while discovered that I was left with nothing but my death speech. So in a voice which reverted to the warble of a boy soprano, I cried shrilly, Ring the cannons and fire all the bells. The effect of this was stupendous. And before anyone out front could volunteer another comment and in a mood of suicide, I flung myself headfirst down the whole flight of stairs. Made as it was in the full muscular flower of my boyhood, that was 
quite some dive. It was the only thing I could think of at the moment. I didn't care whether it killed me or not. It almost did. But also it brought down the house. As the Dubliners, besides being very keen critics, are also generous. And I don't suppose that anything like that backflip had been seen on the shores of the Liffey before. Here was an actor who could fall on his head and really make you believe it. In all the long, striving years since my debut, I've never received such an ovation. Well, here I am with my donkey and cart. You see, I'd, I'd come to Ireland not to act, but to be a painter. I'd always wanted to be a painter. In the spring of that year, I'd arrived, bought the donkey and cart, traveled about Connemara, and found myself in Dublin in the autumn of that year without what are technically referred to as financial resources. And I had a few shillings, but I blew those on a good dinner and a ticket to the theater. The theater was the gate. And on the stage, I recognized in a minor part a young fellow that I'd known in the west of Ireland for a while. He's a folklorist. I went backstage to say hello to him. And he introduced me to the directors, Edwards and McLeamore. And I heard myself introducing myself to them as a noted actor from the Broadway stage. Now, what had possessed me? I don't know why I told that whopper. The idea of earning my living as an actor was so preposterous that it seemed to me probably that the a preposterous story was the only possible way of proposing it. For some reason they they gave me the job. It was a very good part. I'd intimated that I was willing to stay on in Ireland for a short season if sufficiently interesting roles could be found. And the first interesting role was the Archduke, and that's how I started, as I say, in the theater. It was an easy start. I must confess to you that nothing's been easy since then. Every year, I learn how much I've yet to learn. But on that first night of all, I made an important discovery. I learned that an audience can be a very fierce creature, which can turn suddenly dangerous. That fierceness is generally in defense of the fragile miracle which is expected every evening in the theater. The audience defends that miracle. The artist presides over it. Nobody performs that miracle. Everybody contributes to it. And above all, it must not be treated lightly. Respect in the presence of that miracle is a part of the normal respect of the professional for his job. And I learned that job and learned to love the theater. The respect naturally followed. When I started, playing in a play was like playing a game. I didn't care whether I won or not. Now, of course, I do care very much, and I often find myself on the losing side of things, but I wouldn't trade my love for the theater for all the hits on Broadway and the West End. And I'm not proud of my start. I'm not proud of having begun in the theater as an adventurer. And I'm most sincerely grateful to the angry gentleman in the fifth row who raised his voice in the darkness of that Dublin theater and made me the precious gift of stage fright. It was the beginning of respect. Very shortly thereafter, as I told you, I threw myself on my head. It seemed the only thing I could do, falling on my head, is probably what made me an actor. Certainly it's what made me a professional. 